thank you so much for coming. I'm Leah DeFeo, and I am the vice president of the consumer print team at Getty Images. And my name is Sean Waldron. I am the curator on the consumer print team. And today we're going to talk about um, Slim Aaron's, the art and the business. I guess in this scenario, I'm the art and she's the business. Uh, so that's the way that the order is going to go. So uh, Getty Images is, as you may know, one of the, if not the premier licensing, uh, image licensing company in the world. But besides image licensing, we also have a fine art business. Uh, we have a gallery that is in London, the Getty Images Gallery. And we have an online presence uh, at throughphotos.com. So Slim Aarons is one of many, many artists that we uh, work with, and he is uh, a key artist for us, and I want to talk a little bit about his life, and we're going to look at some of his photographs, and then Leah's going to tell you about uh, how Getty manages the business. So George Allen Aarons, the Slim comes later, uh, was born here in Manhattan, 1926. He was orphaned at a young age and raised by his parents and his grandparents on a farm in New Hampshire. Now, Slim developed his New England sensibility and accent that he carried throughout his life very proudly. And you can get, this is a good story that gives you sort of insight into how Slim was as a person. Towards the end of his career, uh, he was casting about for a new assistant. He had a, a whole bevy of assistants um, throughout his career. But he peppered the candidate with some questions. Can you be ready to leave with a little advance notice? Is your passport in order? Can you stand the sun? Can you write? Can you walk up hills at high altitudes? Can you speak any other languages? Can you get up early in the morning, every morning? And once he was satisfied with her answers, he moved on to his rules, which were hard and fast. No heavy suitcases, no tennis rackets, no hairdresser appointments, no mini bar tabs, no shopping, no dry cleaning, no days off, no boyfriends, no sightseeing, and for God's sakes, no cameras. So that's pretty much, you get an idea of what Slim was and how he was as both a person and a photographer. Now, during a turbulent period in his teenage years, Slim's grandmother put a camera in his hand. He really liked the feeling and it was something that he never really put down for the rest of his life. After graduating high school, um, this was just a few years before the start of the Second World War, and Slim saw the Army as a good opportunity to see the world. So he headed to New York City, went to the Times Square Recruitment Center, and signed up. And he talked his way into a job as a hypo dipper, which is the person who takes exposed photographic prints and just dunks them in chemistry to develop them. So that was his first job in photography. But eventually they let him pick up a camera and he was transferred to the West Point Military Academy up the Hudson River and he photographed maneuvers. Now, according to Slim, he was a bit of a hero at West Point and was well looked after by the sergeant's daughters. And like most successful photographers, Slim is very adept at what we would now call crafting your personal brand. And shortly after the war began, the Hollywood director, Frank Capra, came to West Point looking for reporters to work overseas on Yank Magazine, which is a weekly spinoff from the military paper, Stars and Stripes. Now, like many people in Hollywood, Capra was making short films and doing work on behalf of the government in the war effort. And in a first of a pattern that would repeat itself throughout Slim's life, the tall, thin, handsome, and easygoing army photographer made a favorable impression on Capra. And soon, this simple New England farm boy found himself on a Pan Am clipper headed for London in the Yanks' office. Now, here are some pictures of Slim. He was supposed to be as a photographer, but right away they loved his look, so they recruited him to be a model for some of their uh, images. So here he is playing cricket, getting directions from a friendly Londoner, and then just looking dashing in his uniform. The military issued Slim a standard duty, but very cumbersome, speed graphic, which is a plate ca camera. They actually, they were still shooting glass plates then. But he soon ditched it for a lightweight 35 millimeter Leica. I mean, there was no sense of going into war with a glass plate camera. 
Now, Army Slim was known as a bit of a rabble rouser with an earned reputation for using unconventional methods to get a scoop. And during the war, George Silk and Carl Mydens, who were two life photographers covering the war, became close friends of his. The three men stuck together throughout the uh, American campaign through Italy, and he joined the botched invasion of Anzio uncredited by commandeering a jeep. He witnessed intense action, saw some heavy casualties, and was really affected by it. And when German bombs fell on, on, near, on a dock near Anzio, Slim was seriously wounded, um, and the, he later earned a Purple Heart for that. As the campaign ended and the war came to a close, Slim and his two photographer friends rode into Rome together and watched it fall. And little did he know that in a few short years he'd be back there again, but in very different circumstances. So having survived the war, Slim returned to the U.S. determined to continue on his new career path. And unlike many of his fellow war photographers, Slim decided he had seen enough death and destruction to last a lifetime. So when he was called upon to hot foot it to Korea to cover the war there, he let it be known that the only beach he was interested in landing on was one decorated with beautiful girls tanning in a tranquil sun. As he told his longtime friend Frank Zachary, from now on, I'm going to walk on the sunny side of the street. I'm going to have fun photographing attractive people doing attractive things in attractive paces. Many of Slim's friends returned from the war and resumed their civilian lives as editors at magazines such as Life, Look, and Harper's Bazaar. The post-war period was a golden one for American magazines, and there was plenty of work for an experienced photographer with deep connections. So Slim began freelancing for Life magazine in New York, and while there he met and married Rita Dewart, who was an assistant on the photo desk. Um, Rita was from Boston, a city that um, Slim really loved as a child. I mean, he, to him, it was the outer limits of civility and sophistication. So the fact, and he sometimes would even tell everyone that he was a Bostonian himself. With his new bride and with a new assignment from Life, they headed to the West Coast. And uh, they were sent there by Life to start photographing the Hollywood royalty. It was an incredibly exciting time in Hollywood then, I'm sure as many of you know, and it was still a small sort of company town, and Slim really fell in with a, big, a lot of the, the big stars there. He met the legendary staff photographer Clarence Sinclair Bull, who was the staff photographer at MGM, and he imparted some valuable wisdom. Glamour is essential, and illusion must be maintained. And the famed producer and studio head Louis B. Mayer also gave a straightforward edict that Slim took to heart. The women must be beautiful and the men handsome. And it was those two simple lessons that became the guiding principles behind his successful career. While he was in California, Slim managed to photograph all the greats. Marilyn Monroe, Lauren Bacall, Clark Gable, Jimmy Stewart, Sophia Loren. And Jimmy Stewart, in particular, became a close friend with Slim. And since they were both tall and thin, sometimes people confused them. And Stewart himself was even known when people would come up to him on the street and say, are you Jimmy Stewart? He'd go, no, 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 I'm Slim Aarons, the photographer, which I'm sure was really confusing to th the fans. But Hitchcock was also an admirer, and so much so that he apparently based Jimmy Stewart's character and even the apartment in Rear Window on Slim and Slim's real-life New York apartment. And just as Capra had been drawn to him back at West Point, directors such as Howard Hawks, Ring Gardner, and Bruce Manning all put th Slim through screen tests, which he irrefutably, and sometimes quite amusingly, failed. Jean Howard, a beautiful hostess and wife of the powerful talent agent F Charlie Feldman, also became an important friend and confidant. She was a former Ziegfeld Follies girl and the ultimate sort of Hollywood insider, but she was also a serious and talented photographer. She ended up leaving her husband in 1948 to travel around the world as Slim's assistant. In 2003, while talking to Vanity Fair, Slim said that Jean was his best friend and mentor in Hollywood, and she also taught him an important lesson, the connection between friends and access. Now, Italy was one of the first countries to open to foreigners after the war, and by 1948, Rome was the center of Italian cinema and offered a more affordable alternative for film production. It became a hot destination for celebrities and uh, the Hollywood studios, so Life decided to open a branch there. Given Slim's connections with the Hollywood crowd, they offered him the position of opening up the branch, 
which he jumped at. So he headed off to Rome and settled in the fabled Excelsior Hotel on the Via Veneto, which was a hotbed of activity filled with actors, newspapermen, and courtesans. Now that, vix w that mix is very deliberate because actors and actresses decorate the lobby, newspapermen provide free publicity, and the courtesans occupy the most expensive suites, paid for, of course, by their lovers. So Slim spent his days hanging out in the hotel and photographing movie stars, gangsters, and occasionally the Vatican. Now one of those gangsters was none other than Lucky Luciano, seen here in the center. In 1949, Luciano was banished from Rome for his sins and sent back to his hometown in Sicily. Now the mobster personally selected Slim to accompany him on the journey, even sending and creating a wild goose chase to divert and d confuse other photographers. Luciano was very controlling of the story that Slim told. He and his father kissed while greeting one another, and he turned to Slim and said, don't photograph that, everyone will think I'm a sissy. Slim said that the one mistake he took when posing for this photo, however, was that he opened up his jacket. Strapped to his belt there, you see, that's actually his light meter, but everyone assumed it was a pistol and he heard about it for years afterwards. Now, his time in California helped form Slim's professional philosophy and refined his approach, but it was in Italy that he really catapulted to the next level professionally. And years later, he pointed to one assignment in particular as the crucial turning point. It was a life cover story on Betsy von Furstenberg, a German baroness and a budding movie star. When he turned up for the shoot on the scheduled day, he found Betsy, who was 19 years old at the time, a little weary, shall we say, from too many um, nights enjoying the nightlife in Rome. He knew that it would never work in her current state, so he quickly whisked her away, took her up the Amalfi Coast, put her in a hotel for two days of sleep, rest, and healthy meals. All the while, routinely calling her parents back in Germany to reassure them he wasn't taking advantage of their young daughter. <laughs> But finally, after a few days, they set to work. And then the resulting portrait, which you see here, appeared on the January 1951 cover in Life, which is a major coup both for Slim and for her. In those days, not many magazines had a global footprint like Life did. And a Life cover credit for a photographer w provided entry to an exclusive club. It was a true honor. And Slim had done it by the time he was 25. The von Furstenberg experience also gave a gut check and, and a boost of confidence to Slim in his ability to control the pace, temper, and location of his shoots. And as the industry grew to embrace armies of assistants and mountains of equipment, Slim stuck to his preferred method of traveling light and moving fast. In his own words, no assistants, no props, no stylists, no lights, no problems. That's how I work. While his reasoning may have been personal preference, it was also extremely practical access to the palatial homes and opulent estates that he had become known for was much easier to negotiate when it was just him and maybe an assistant. Now, you can see here, here he is hopping off on yet another Pan Am flight, and he routinely carried a stainless steel briefcase with a single camera plus a backup body, a few lenses, a light meter. He measured out his film for the day, threw it in a bag that he carried himself, and he sometimes would carry along a small tripod. You can see it here strapped to the top of the bag. When he did have an assistant, what he called a tutto fare, which is Italian for handyman, she was utilized as a fixer, not as a technical assistant. And I say she purposely. Almost all of Slim's assistants were young, female, and attractive, mainly because they provided a welcome distraction and useful cover. Clay Felker, the New York Magazine founder, witnessed Slim and his girl Friday shoot a story, and he was absolutely gobsmacked. He categorized them as a guerrilla team. He said they went in, went out, no one knew what hit them. In 1951, uh, Frank Zachary, who was a close friend of Slim's, began his celebrated and highly influential run as the picture editor and art director of Holiday Magazine. The courtly and unpretentious editor was responsible for the look and feel of what many consider the most sophisticated and urbane magazine of the 1950s a decade revered for its sophistication and urbanity. Now while at Holiday, Zachary developed a portrait style 
he called environmental photography. There were meant to be no close-ups. Subjects would be presented in their natural environment. So you think of this actress by the pool, or a captain of industry in his office, um, or a aristocrat seen on their huge estate in Europe. And this, that's slim up on the ladder, and then that's the actual resulting shot there. Now, the Holiday packed a one-two punch of writing and photography. Frank Zachary recruited Arnold Newman, Henri Cartier-Bresson, Tom Holliman, Fred Maroon, and of course, Slim Ahrens. And for more than a decade, Slim was sent to all four corners of the globe, little, often with no guidance other than, Slim, bring me back the snaps and make sure it doesn't look like Brooklyn. Now, Slim found a lifetime friend and mentor in Frank Zachary. The two men respected one each other personally, but also connected on an artistic level. Zachary recognized Slim's unique skills and strengths and utilized them with razor focus. And when Zachary was passed over as editor-in-chief of Holiday in 1964, he, Slim and other top staff organized a full-page ad in the New York Times supporting his friends and colleagues. They characterized Holiday as a magazine of the highest editorial standards and integrity, and more than 50 signatures were placed on it, including many of the bold-faced literary names of the day. The two men, unfortunately, it didn't work and Zachary had to move on, but the two men were professionally reunited when he took over as editor-in-chief of Town & Country in the early 1970s. And Slim, stayed, Slim and Frank both worked at Town & Country for another 20 years after that. When it came time for Slim's first book, A Wonderful Time, which is now a collector's item, I look it up on eBay, you'll be shocked at the price, Frank was naturally called upon to edit. In the introduction to, his second to Slim's second book, Once Upon a Time, Zachary wrote, Slim has documented the life of the wealthy, the privileged, and the leisured for 50 years. Without animus or adulation, he's mirrored the changing countenance of society, faceless and all. His sustained focus on the historically inaccessible segment of society is without parallel in the annals of photography. Others have recorded the manner and mores of the classes, but Slim's achievement stands alone. It is the only visual chronicle, and in living color too, of the privileged class of our time, the way they lived, dressed, and furnished their homes. His pictures are works of a consummate artist in the guise of a photojournalist. They are carefully crafted, articulated images shaped by a keen sense of form and design. It's their impeccable and seemingly artless composition that makes Slim's photographs so easy to enjoy and appreciate. Over and above their technical virtuosity, Slim's photographs are profoundly human. His images have the glamour and appeal of movies, but with a vital difference. He projects fantasy that is based on reality, the good life that exists beyond the foxhole and the battlefield. Those were Zachary's beautiful words about his friend Slim. Now, no single series embodies all the elements that Zachary references, a visual, visual chronicle, in living color, a fantasy brought to life, than the group of photographs taken at the Palm Springs home of Joseph and Nelda Linsk. The home, which is an architectural marvel designed by Richard Neutra in 1946 and commonly known as the Kaufman Desert House, is the definitive example of the international style of architecture. Nelda, who is a former model, had visited Palm Springs in 1964 to escape the brutal New York winter and fallen in love with the city's climate and people. In January 1970, Slim was in Palm Springs on assignment for town and country. Truman Capote had recently joined other celebrities such as Lucille Ball, Cary Grant, and Frank Sinatra and bought a house in the, in the desert city. So while in town to shoot Truman, Slim called up Nelda, who was an old friend from New York, of course, and asked if she wouldn't mind bringing a few friends around so he could photograph the pool. She obliged, and a small group that included the industrial designer Raymond Lowy, the actress Rita Barron, interior designer Steve Chase, and a former model, Helen Zozo Captur, languidly gathered for afternoon cocktails around the pool with the majestic San Jacinto Mountains hovering off in the distance. This is a time lapse which really illustrates Slim's approach. He obviously arrived early, chose a spot, set his camera up on a simple tripod. By this point in his career, Slim was pretty comfortable and skilled at navigating these potentially choppy social waters. And it's easy to imagine him joining the party, chatting with guests, dropping all the right names but never being pretentious, and occasionally stepping quietly back and tripping the shutter. As the scene candidly and organically unfolds, he simply goes along for the ride. 
Now recently, Nelda, who reveled in the 15 minutes of fame the shoot has afforded her, jokingly remarked, if I had known the photo would become so famous, I would have dressed a little better. But that would have ruined it, I think. For this is fantasy based on reality. These are real people unconsciously living lives that are incredibly fabulous, charming, and chic, don't get me wrong, but most important, appear not entirely unfamiliar or out of reach. Now, Getty Images has seen an incredible spike recently in searches around the concept of authenticity. Poolside gossip is the antidote to carefully curated digital lives that we now face. It is, in the words of Zachary, lean and clean and re as refreshing as a glass of spring water. So I brought a copy of the print here. So this is from our booth. You can come and come up front afterwards and see it. This is the image from the shoot. Or you can come to the booth and learn more about it. That image is our best-selling image on the business side. So um, that is our best-selling image of Slamera. It's definitely the most recognizable. So um, throughout his career, Slim was doing his shoots, packing his, his film away, sticking it in the attic of his farmhouse in upstate New York, and just letting it accumulate. And in 1973, that attic was kind of bursting at the seams. So he said, there has to be something I have to do here. And was there hardly a movie star, socialite, or European aristocrat that he hadn't even photographed? That, you know, there didn't seem there was anyone left. So at that time, um, he took it as a sign, and he decided to do a book that I mentioned earlier, A Wonderful Time. Now, it wasn't an immediate hit for Slim. The 70s were hard eco economic times in America, and the counterculture counter tastemakers of the day weren't interested in looking at a book that had photographs of people that kind of looked like their grandparents' friends. <laughs> so it sold a respectable 20,000 copies at the time, and Slim continued to do his work uh, for Town & Country and lots of other magazines for two more decades. But then, in 1991, Frank Zachary retired, and Slim decided he would too. And it was around this time that the 70 Counters Culture group had aged and mellowed a little bit, right? So suddenly, manicured lawns and island resorts didn't look that bad. And compared to the tabloid culture dominating the 1990s, or what R Vanity, Refa Vanity Fair called unattractive people in unattractive places doing unattractive things, Slim's rose-colored version of the world presented a nostalgic look at a not too distant past. So the fashion crowd especially couldn't get enough of it. Anna Sui, Michael Corls, Paul Smith, and Ralph Lauren looked to Slim as both an inspiration and a blueprint. The book became took on a, a second life of its own and became a must-have um, book for any designer, either interior or fashion. It is said at the time that 47 copies disappeared from Vogue's offices. They just couldn't keep it in his dock. So it was Slim who was, by all means, um, thrilled with his resurgence and really started to look at his archive again. And he said it best, in 2003, he said, if you want to do a story about old Hollywood, what picture do you open up with? If you want to do a story about Palm Beach, what picture do you open up with? If you want to do a feature on Capri, what picture do you open up with? So it's with that, I'd like to run through some images. I've put together a slideshow. There's Slim there. He's ever-present cigarette. Um, and we can just sit and look at some images for a bit. And you can really get a sense of Slim's career. And then Leah will pick up and talk about that resurgence that happened in the 90s. And that's when Getty enters the picture.
it's great to see all those pictures. It's amazing. Um, so Sean left off in the 90s, and that's when um, Slim Aarons had a real resurgence, um, largely due in part to Getty Images. So I want to start by going back to 1995. 1995 is the year that Mark Getty and Jonathan Klein started Getty Images. And Getty Images as a company has a long history of acquisitions. Um, we've acquired many photographers' archives, um, many smaller stock photography agencies, and um, we, are the world, we have the world's largest collection of photography for licensing and for distribution. In 1996, we purchased the Holton Archive, and that's um, a, a portion of the Holton Archive is what you see pictured here. Um, it was in London, and we purchased it, and when we purchased it, it held over 60 million vintage prints, negatives, transparencies, glass plates, and more, starting from the birth of photography. The archive was, and quite frankly, it still is, absolutely massive. Um, it's a treasure trove. I mean, we uncover gems there all the time. There's literally boxes that we haven't even gotten to open yet. So um, it was around the same time, um, in the mid-90s, quite frankly, Slim had been a little bit forgotten. Um, however, there is a London gallerist. He's a photo gallerist. His name is Michael Hoppen. Um, some of you may know him. He still runs a great gallery in London. Um, and he purchased a couple of um, Kings of Hollywood shots, and that's the shot you see here. He purchased those from Slim Aarons, and he uh, went to his home in Bedford, New York to pick them up, and when he was there, he was really impressed with what he saw. And as Slim tells it, the next thing that happened was, oops, there, sorry, um, there was a knock on my door, and a standing there in a windbreaker was a young, good-looking guy. I assumed he was a landscaper looking for a job, but turns out it was Mark Getty, owner of Getty Images. Mark had heard from Michael Hoppen that Slim's archive was something he really had to see. So the story goes that Mark and Slim climbed the staircase and went up to his attic and went in to see boxes and boxes and boxes of... Um, Let's see, they're right here. Boxes that look just like this, um, with many different destinations on them. Bora Bora, Cortina, Rome, Paris, London, um, cities all over the world. And Mark pointed to a box labeled Rome and asked if he could peek inside. So he did, and the first transparency he pulled up, he looked at it and said, my God, that's where we held our wedding reception. So an immediate connection between Mark and Slim was made. Um, Mark decided right then and there to purchase the collection. It was an immediate decision. And, um, you know, he asked Slim what he wanted for it. And I can't disclose um, what he paid for it. Um, but I will say it took a real leap of faith for Mark to make that purchase. Getty Images had just acquired 60 million images. And we still hadn't explored, you know, what was in those 60 million boxes full of images. Um, and, and I know when this talk is over, the first thing that's going to happen is someone's going to raise their hand and say, well, how much did you pay for the collection, right? Because I'm the business person. That's what they ask. Um, and again, I can't tell you that, but I can tell he was very happy with it because he was quoted in Vanity Fair as um, saying this about the collection. I'm going to use a profanity, so I'm just giving you a heads up in case you don't want to hear a profanity. Slim said, he gave me what I call fuck you money. Remember this because it's important. You're never free until you have fuck you money. So Slim was very happy with the amount of money he got. Um, and to Getty Images, it was a big sum of money. Um, but it was what, one that Mark believed in. He felt this was a worthwhile investment. He saw the value in these images. And he made a good move. The collection for us has returned many, many times over. So the key to monetizing the archive was first knowing what was in it, right? So the collection was brought from New York over to London, and it was hundreds of boxes. And our archivists at our gallery went through them and quickly pulled out images that either were best known and that were, you know, had already been published, already been, you know, known about, 
um, or things we thought would sell really well as fine art prints. And we showcased them at Getty Images Gallery. And at that time, Getty Images Gallery was housed um, in the first floor of Michael Hoppin's gallery in Chelsea in London. Um, today, the gallery is on East Castle Street, which is by Oxford Circus. Um, and we are, um, we are no longer uh, partners with Michael Oppen, but we work with him all the time. So today, we actually are still going through those boxes. And in fact, twice a year, we release never before seen images. So there's so many images in that collection that we're still releasing things that have never been seen by the public. So the way we monetize the collection is um, three ways, uh, three categories. The first category is through prints and publishing. The second is through editorial licensing. And the third is through commercial products. So I'm going to take you through those three things. So um, the first is, like I said, prints. And with Slim's photos, what really worked was that it was the right content at the right time. The mid-90s saw a real resurgence of mid-century modern design. And people loved the lifestyle that was depicted in the photographs and the fashion of the era. So momentum continued with Slim's photography, um, but it was largely because we created a market for it. And beyond creating a market, we really created a brand. The brand of Slim Aaron's is immediately associated with an aspirational lifestyle. And it's a brand we've worked really hard to both build and to protect at Getty Images. The vast majority of revenue um, that we generate, and you know, I went through the categories with you guys, um, but the vast majority actually comes from fine art print sales. And from a print perspective, we sell these prints um, through many dis di different distribution outlets, um, first and foremost our own. So we sell these prints through Getty Images Gallery as well as photos.com. And we sell them through a reseller network. So we work with um, galleries um, all over the world, Staley Wise here in New York. We work with retailers like Jonathan Adler, uh, One Kings Lane. And any Slim Errands print, though, that you get at any of those places, they all originate with us. And when it comes to signed prints, we have some inventory still. Um, but back in the day, when we first bought the collection, if someone wanted to purchase a signed print, we would drive right up to Slim's house, and we would have him sign the prints. Um, but after his passing, um, we began to offer estate-stamped prints. And that's a way for us to carry on his legacy. And we offer those in editions of 150. And you can see a handful of them. They're actually on display at our booth in 505, um, if you want to see them. Um, and we also offer open edition prints. And by doing that, um, it really allows buyers access to his work at multiple different price points. We are very particular and very controlling about who we partner with um, to sell Slim's work. So any reseller that gets approved by us um, needs to provide attribution back to Getty Images. And you know they will present the work, um, but present it as coming from Getty, which is the Slim of, home of the Slim Aaron's archive. And again, you know it needs to be clear that any print that's sold in the marketplace originates with us. Um, they're all sourced from the original negatives, and they're all printed in London with careful oversight by our team. Um, we hand pack these prints. We really make sure that when they arrive, they arrive beautifully. We look for opportunities to sell fine art um, places like this, right, where we know there will be photography buyers. Um, and our bread and butter is actually selling to trade clients. So interior designers outfitting clients' homes. Um, we have a lot of interior designers who work in Palm Springs and you know, in the places where, slimmed a lot of, uh, you know, where Slim's photos were taken. We regularly exhibit at trade fairs. We're at Maison J in Paris um, every year. And it's about building those relationships with the clients that come year after year. So that's the print side of the business, the fine art print. Um, and what goes hand in hand in that um, is publishing. Those two things, they really feed each other. As Sean mentioned, Slim's first book, A Wonderful Time, was published in 1974. Um, and it sells for hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars on eBay. Um, you know, we knew there was demand for more books, and it was natural to do more books of Slim's work. 
there was a VP at Getty Images um, named Eric Rackless who decided that Abrams was the right partner for us to work with um, for book publishing. So we published our first book um, for Slim Errands, which was Once Upon a Time. And since then, we've published an additional four books. So A Place in the Sun, Poolside with Slim Errands, La Dolce Vita, and Slim Errands Women. The books have been very successful, and it's why we keep publishing them. Um, and they really help raise awareness and generate demand for the fine art print sales. So it's a really, really good tool for us. The next category of revenue is editorial licensing. So this is a snapshot from GettyImages.com, and you can see a lot of Slim's images here. Um, although the Slim archive um, in London holds over a million images and pieces of ephemera, we have less than 5,000 images scanned and available online. So it's a small fraction of what we hold. Uh, those images are made available for editorial use only, and they're very popular with magazines. As Sean said earlier, you know, if someone is looking to do um, a story about old Hollywood, you know, they come to us and they look for the Kings of Hollywood shot, for example. Um, but you know, editorial licensing again is not the main driver for revenue for us. Um, but like publishing, it helps to make sure that Slim's images are out in the public eye, are being seen in magazines, are being seen, you know, and, and it generates interest. The next category, um, this is about Slim, and it's not about Slim and his attractive photographing of people, although um, it works. Um, this is um, some, an example of our commercial deals. So, as I mentioned, images listed on GettyImages.com are listed for editorial use only. And we welcome conversations about commercial use, but commercial use becomes a conversation that's actually had directly with me. Um, and we carefully consider every opportunity, but the deals we do are few and far between. And again, that's about building Slim's brand and about protecting it. And we recently did an exclusive deal with Orla Bar Brown um, for men's swimsuits. And this is an example of some of the suits. And they currently sell for over $350. So it's a high-end luxury product, a great fit for the Slim Aaron's brand. And the great thing for us and the reason that it became a real win for us is Orla Bar Brown was happy to tell the story of Slim Aaron's, to tell the story of these photographs and of the photographer. Um, you go to the website, you can read about it. Um, you go to the store and you'll see the hang tags that have information about him on it. So we're really thrilled these hit the market um, very recently and we're really thrilled that they're out there now. We have um, a dedicated individual at our archive in London. Um, his name is Alex um, and we jokingly call him the Slim Aaron's police. So his job is to ensure that Slim Aaron's images are used for the terms and conditions that were set forth um, for their use. So if somebody purchases an editorial license for a Slim Aaron's image to use it in a magazine, that they don't then turn up selling those images somewhere, right? So we're very particular about um, monitoring that. Um, and we have a legal team in place that helps us to um, ensure that if we're seeing unauthorized use, that it's being addressed. In summary, um, the business of monetizing Slim Aaron's is quite var varied, uh, but the bread and butter is for us fine art prints. And um, we really hope you'll come find us and come take a look at the prints in person. We have a variety of the um, estate stamp prints and others in our booth. It's number 505. And we have talks throughout the weekend. So we have um, talks meeting our curator, Sean, learning more about the collection. We're happy to take any questions um, you know, afterwards. We'll be around. And you know, we'll be at the booth as well, 505. So um, thank you. Anything else?